Good morning, everyone. My name is Isaiah Pierce, and this is Total Sovereign Grace Ministries. Across the churches in America, we have seen a transition from the Word of God to a cotton candy gospel. This is not to be confused with the Church of Entertainment, or the Gospel According to I, or American Idolatry. Although all of these have one thing in common, it's that it's a man-centered doctrine. But America's churches are in what I call spiritual candy land. Why do I call it spiritual candy land? Because everything in candy land is sweet and appealing to the flesh. You've seen the board game. You've seen pictures of candy land. We've made a little graphic here that you can look at. Everything is candy. Everything is sugar. Everything is sweet. No bitterness in candy land. As Americans, we have first-hand knowledge on our diets and things of that nature. We like to eat sugary things. We like to eat sweet things. We have sweet tooths here in America. And in the same sense, we carry that over into our spiritual doctrine. In the modern-day churches, we see the same environment. Wherever you go in Candyland, you're going to see candy. We've established that. Whatever you see is pleasant to the eye. Whatever you eat is pleasant to the mouth. And in the spiritual sense in America's churches, we hear a message that is so watered down that God has been effectively castrated. In America's church, churches, love, grace, blessings, they're all mentioned. There's no problem mentioning that. And that indeed is a very critical part of our God but that's the sweet part. Everything about God is just. Everything about God is perfect. But when I say the sweet part, I mean it's the part that appeals to us the most. Because God is love. God is blessings. God provides grace. God is merciful. We love to hear that. But I believe that we must preach the full gospel. The full word of God. And many churches have decided that the method of teaching the entire Word of God is not effective. They have decided in their finite human minds that the teachings on hell, the sovereignty of God, the just righteousness of God, the reality and seriousness of sin and the preaching on sin is not effective because it may hurt the membership of the church. But the body of Christ is not a social club. It is not about how big the congregation is. I know a lot of times we get carried away about how many people are in the church. And things of that nature. All things that are just are fleshly, carnal things. Some churches have decided that they don't want to preach on hell and sin. Because it scares people. And they don't want to use what they call scare tactics to witness to people. But as King Solomon said in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So what Solomon is saying is that fearing God is a good thing. Having reverence for, fearing, understanding that God can be a God of wrath. That is the beginning of wisdom. But what we see so often throughout our churches in America is that the fear of God is often neglected. It's often scorned. It's often preached against. God wouldn't want you to be scared of Him. God is love. Something that you would often hear. But that's not what the Word of God says. Matthew 10.28 And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So what we see here in Matthew 10.28 is that our fear should not be by what the systems of this earth can do to our bodies, but we should fear the one who can destroy our body and our soul in hell. And that is God. Maybe the abandonment on these teachings is because without the fear of God, without the fear of hell, 
Mankind feels liberated and free to do what he or she wants. If you're not teaching your flock that adultery, drunkenness, homosexuality, theft, lying, lust, and manipulation are sins, and God hates sin, and God's at war with the natural man, and if you're not teaching that God takes sin serious, so much that people are sent to an everlasting inferno for their sins. If you're not teaching that God is the ultimate authority, if you're not teaching that a just God must have payment for sin, then you can never have checks and balances because the, this word, the word of God, is our moral compass. It is the ultimate authority. Psalm 7, 11 says that God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. To be clear, churches don't necessarily have to come out and deny the eternal place of hell for the unsaved in order for them to be in spiritual candy land. All they have to do is not preach on it. They don't have to endorse sin like homosexuality and abortion. All they have to do is not speak out against it. They don't have to deny the sovereignty of God. All they have to do is endorse a man-centered doctrine. If your church or assembly is not preaching on what awaits those that deny Christ, if they are not preaching on God's hatred and His judgment for sin, if they're preaching a message of come as you are, God must accept you for who you are, God just loves and He loves and He doesn't care about all that sin stuff, your church is in spiritual candy land. And I urge you to find a new assembly. I urge you to get into the Word of God to see the truth. God in spiritual candy land is a God of your own making. You don't preach on anything that offends the natural man. You don't preach on what happens to the natural man outside of Jesus Christ. You don't have a God that contradicts you because you've eliminated everything that God stands for. His hatred of sin, His righteousness, and when you eliminate that, you tear down God. This God that is worshipped all across America is an idol. When you remove the just and righteous judgment from God, you remove an attribute from God. His wrath is equal to His love. God is not one-dimensional. You cannot have God without just. You cannot have God without righteousness. You cannot have God without perfection. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Did you hear what that said? Did you hear what Paul said? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. He didn't say just some. He didn't say, well, you know, some of the sins are not as important as the others. It's okay here. He says, all ungodliness. You cannot remove God's wrath and justice from Him. To do so is to tear down His majesty and Godhood. To remove God's wrath is to diminish Him in all of His perfect ways. And to do so is to create a God of your own image, a God of your own liking, a God of your own making. When you remove the wrath of God from Him, you have an idol. Because when you remove or silence and fail to speak about all the attributes, the just attributes of God, you make God into your own image. You make God to only a beacon of love. But that's not what this word says. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, and e but Esau have I hated. To remove the wrath of God is to remove a key element of the saving doctrine of Christ. Mankind must know that he is a sinner doomed to hell to understand what God's love saved him from. If mankind cannot understand God is a just God who executes his just decrees 
on mankind for his sins. Mankind cannot come to the full realization on what Christ's precious blood delivered him from, delivered us from. When mankind eliminates the condemnation of sin from preaching, when he eliminates the doctrine of God's infinite contempt of sin, when he eliminates the teaching that God is a just God and must have payment for sin, he diminishes the blood of Jesus Christ. If sin is not actively pointed out and preached against at churches, how can anyone be saved? How can anyone know why Christ and his work on the cross was of infinite importance? How can the churches be the light that is not of the world when it won't stand for the principles and doctrines of God that are supposed to be set apart from the world. I know oftentimes we see churches, they get so caught up into the culture, into what the world's themes are, and they take their eyes off the Word of God. Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this world. But so often we see churches just, they're just tagging along and getting in line with, with the lost, getting in the hog pen, casting their pearls to the swine. If they have any pearls. Paul doesn't tell us to jump into the jacuzzi with the world. And try to make our message more appealing. So we have a bigger crowd. No. Everything that this book says. Is against what mankind's very nature is. Everything that this book says. Has always went against how the natural mind thinks, because the natural mind is enmity against God. James 4.4 4 tells us that friendship with the world is to be an enemy of God. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I mean, these verses are from the Word of God. Oftentimes we look at them and we just say, yeah, but does it really mean that? But does it really mean that? Yes, I can assure you that to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of the, uh, enemy of the Most High God. It does mean what it says. The Bible is its best interpreter. Do we preach on the grace of God and His loving kindness and His mercy? Yes, absolutely. We preach the full gospel. But you cannot preach on God's grace without preaching on what He is gracious on. And you can't preach on His loving kindness without preaching on how precious it is because of what He's done, because of what we have done to Him. How offensive our sins and transgressions are. You can't preach on His mercy without preaching on what He has spared us from. The saving knowledge of Jesus Christ comes when you realize you're a sinner deserving of God's wrath. When you realize that Christ paid your debt that He didn't owe. And you could have never paid that debt not if you lived a million lifetimes doing every good deed and pious act and religiousness. Over a million lifetimes, you could not pay for one sin. Spiritual candy land is all about the milk. It's all about the sugar. It's all about the sweetness. But you can't realize how sweet the gospel is without understanding the bitterness you give to God through your sin. When you realize that every day, you get up and you fall short and no matter what you do, you can't help yourself because of all you do. Everything you do, you just fall short and sin against the one true God. When you realize that, you understand just how sweet the gospel is. If all you have tasted 
sugar in your life, if you've never had the meat, the meat will repulse you. The meat won't go down the right tube. And what is the meat? The meat is the food that's tough to chew for us sometimes. It's hard for our carnal, natural minds to swallow because it convicts us of sin. It tells us God is a just and righteous God who must have payment for sin. It tells us that we are not the authors of our own destiny like we so often think. The meat is what directly goes against what the natural mind thinks. The meat goes against the original lie from Satan that we can be gods. It's easy to say, amazing grace. It is. Everybody loves that song. But it's not always easy to say that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Mankind doesn't want to accept the fact that he is a sinner and totally deserving of God's wrath. You know, I've heard people they say, well, I don't deserve to go to hell. I'm not that bad. But we must realize that every single one of us is deserving of God's wrath. We have broken His laws. We've all fallen short of God's glory. Mankind doesn't want to admit that he is eternally lost without Christ. Mankind doesn't want to admit that he's blind. The wrath of God is equally important because it lets you know that you're deserving of God's divine justice and you will never be able to understand and appreciate and acknowledge how amazing his grace is if you don't know what you've been saved from. So are you wondering the chocolate roads and clinging to the candy cane trees? Are you believing that sin is just something to brush off because we're all human? Are you believing that God could never send someone to hell? Are you believing that God's hatred for sin and His enemies is non-existent? If you are, you're in spiritual candy land. You are believing in an a la carte God, a I'll choose this off the buffet line, but not this, God. But let me tell you, you either believe in the omnipotent, righteous, justice, gracious, merciful God, or you don't. You can't pick and choose the attributes of God. By doing so, you reduce Him to nothing more than a vain idol. So what will you choose today? Will you choose to continue to run down the streets of cotton candy and chocolate and all the sweet things? Or are you going to choose to embrace the full gospel that we are deserving of God's wrath, but Christ, those key words, those two words, but Christ was the substitute for us. You cannot remove the fact that mankind is a sinner. You cannot remove the fact that mankind is deserving of God's eternal wrath from the gospel of Christ. To do so reduces the blood of Christ. Because what has he saved us from? Is he just our personal God of blessing that blesses us whenever we need something? God does that. God does bless people. But He's much more than that. He's much more than just a God that answers prayers. He's a God who saves. He's a God who's just. He's a God who's righteous. He's a God who, despite being sinned against, despite having transgressions against Him by mankind, despite our offensive nature, His mercy his mercy provided a way of escape through Jesus Christ. We ask the Lord to bless the reading of His Word today. God bless you all.